How did China grow its economy in double digits for several decades? Part 2 Communism meets capitalism, with a cynical smile. The development of Chinese economy, was the clear paradox of the communist China, with their socialistic views, in perfect tango with the greedy capitalists. Nobody seemed to notice the irony. The totalitarian CCP regime, took the side of the corporations and businesses, with no concern for any international rules, and ruthlessly displaced its own people. The impoverished population was eager to improve their standard of living. The foreign corporations were keen to cash in on the cheap labor, a very cooperative government, and extremely lax regulations. How, the lack of free speech, helped companies in China. This level of ease of doing business is unachievable in any country, which follows the democratic model, or countries where the rule of law is enforced, and protests and free press are tolerated. So, the Chinese growth model is so unique, that it can never be replicated, anywhere else. It's a perfect combination of a totalitarian regime, a large working age population, heavy incentivization, and a minimal environmental regulation. A large group of foreign companies took advantage of the favorable conditions, and were ready to set up their manufacturing base, in China. Internal competition and pressure, within CCP regional leaders. But this model did have some limitations beyond a decade or so. This is when the CCP helped with the second impetus, around the mid-1990s. From the time the CCP took over in 1949, there were regional and local CCP leaders, who behaved like warlords, in their respective region of influence. The hierarchical structure worked very well for the party, in their command and control. It was almost like multi-level marketing model. The lowest level members always work the hardest, but it benefited the topmost members the most, with both influence and wealth. This structure was used to produce more grains in the Great Leap Forward in the 1950s. Every local CCP leader was supposed to show improvement, or, removed from their position of power. So, the local CCP leader had every incentive to lie, and sure they did. These lies caused a severe catastrophe, because, during the Great Famine of 1958 to 1961, the CCP leaders claimed higher quantity of grain production, to retain their power. Hiding the truth led to starvation and death of their own people. This led to the higher level CCP leaders believe, that there is indeed a growth in production of grains, when there was really a high deficit in production. Even if they came to know the truth, they looked the other way, because, their own positions would have been in jeopardy, if they did not meet the higher and higher quota of grain production. Fuzzy Economics this had direct relevance with China's growth story past the mid-1990s. Whenever it appeared a high growth rate was not achievable, the local CCP leaders were under severe pressure, to produce the desired or expected growth rate, or face consequences. So, they devised a strategy, and that involved building real estates and related infrastructure. They just kept pushing more and more real estate development. This created a situation, where whole new localities were created, with all the infrastructure, roads, traffic lights, water and sewage, electricity connections, but nobody was living on these residential or other buildings. These cities were termed as ghost cities. At any given time, there were always tens of millions of unoccupied residential houses, and apartments available in China. This way, the local CCP leaders met, or, exceeded their target of growth, extending them to retain their positions of power within the party. Many other novel methods were also devised to keep the growth percentage high, though it served no useful purpose for the economy. Corruption at its best. For all their efforts, the CCP leaders didn't go empty-handed. The party leaders, and their relatives, were always directly or indirectly involved in all private businesses, both big, and small. 
This allowed the corrupt party leaders to become very rich, though most of the money was hidden, or transferred abroad. Many of the real estate properties in the ghost cities were owned by the party leaders themselves. The CCP understood the pulse of the capitalists. They knew that they'll keep investing, as long as they can show a high growth in GDP, on paper, and they were absolutely right. Though there were some skeptics, who wanted to check the authenticity of the data, those skeptics were pushed aside as fear mongers. Everyone wanted a piece of the growth in China. The Wall Street analysts and other investment gurus predicted, that if anyone wants to get a high rate of return, there is no better place than China. Nobody needed to know, how the growth was achieved, or, if it's even real. The frenzy was so high, that China reached a point, that it didn't have to allure the investors anymore. This led to more money into China, and needless to say, it just kept the positive economic spiral going up, and the infrastructure improved even further. Imitating the West The cities of China, like Shenzhen, Beijing, Shanghai, Wuhan, Hangzhou, and many more started looking familiar to the Westerners, with skyscrapers, and all the glitter of the modern era. China seemed to have become integrated with the developed world, after their economic liberalization. A poor country, with a very low GDP per capita in the 1970s, had cities resembling more like London, Paris, or New York, in just over a couple of decades. Chinese Consumerism The Western economic forecasters and analysts, used the Western template of spending of consumers, to the Chinese people. So, the entire Western consumer market was recreated in China, despite the fact, that the Chinese had a habit of saving 40% of their earnings on average, with a much lower level of consumption to their Western counterparts. They used these savings, in real estate purchases. There were many big names, and other famous brands, who suffered heavy losses, due to less than expected sales and counterfeits availability. But, they continued their expansion in Chinese cities, with huge investments, in the hope, that they will one day recoup their money and make big profits. Perception is more important than reality, is image everything. Despite all the efforts of the CCP leaders to market themselves, as a never-ending growth story, and raising unnecessary buildings, it was getting difficult to sustain the growth. During the huge economic crisis of 2008, the Chinese faced their biggest challenge, when the entire world was going through an economic downturn. But, the Chinese will have none of it. All the constructions, and activities surrounding the Beijing Olympics are now over. But the undeterred top CCP leaders, wanted their high growth story to continue. Even though China was extremely dependent on exports, and the exports were falling at a rapid rate in 2008 and 2009, the CCP leaders decided that the Chinese growth will be maintained at 9% or more. In fact, from that point onwards, China started depicting that they are untouchable, and their economy will never falter. The Chinese knew they needed the Western economic commentators and writers on their side, and keep spreading this miracle growth story. They realized, as long as the popular media show them in good light, the investors will believe it. There were enough incentives for the Western media and businesses, to keep hyping the China growth story. Economic Growth, Riding, on a Mountain of Debt During the economic downturn of 2008, and beyond, China became the only country growing rapidly among the big economies. The question is, how did they achieve it? The shortest answer is, by creating an unbelievable amount of debt. All over the world, every country was printing money, and increasing their debt levels, to stimulate their stalled economies. But, the level of debt in China, was in its own trajectory. China had a singular focus, and that was to keep their growth story intact. So, their banks, like, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, ICBC, Bank of China, China Construction Bank, Minsheng Bank, and many other banks, were lending money, 
in such high levels. By 2008, the debt levels on the Chinese banks were already above 100% of China's GDP, but in the next nine years, it went up to 240% of its GDP. In 2020, public data released showed the debt to be above 300%. The actual debt level is expected to be a lot higher. On top of that, China also has a lot of debt that doesn't show up on the books, known as shadow banking. The money was being spent on a feverish pace of construction for a large part, but there were other utilities as well, including high-speed rail, military modernization, internal surveillance, incentives given to many industries, and support to state-run corporations. The ridiculous amount of debt allowed China to keep growing at around 9% average over a large period between 2008 to 2019. The costliest of all projects, BRI aka OBOR. Since 2013, the Belt and Road Initiative, initiated by Xi Jinping, the China Development Bank, CDB, and the Export-Import Bank of China, have been issuing debts, in the hundreds of billions, in US dollar denominations, trying to prop up the Chinese global influence. Though the BRI project may not be a good business model, there is no denial of its positive economic impact on China, at least in the short term. A virus with Chinese origin, developing into a pandemic. In January 2020, China announced to the world of a new kind of coronavirus, which later came to be known as COVID-19, which had originated from Wuhan, one of China's major cities. Initially, China downplayed the seriousness of the virus, and even criticized any country which issued a travel ban of its citizens, while it did the exact same for any resident from Wuhan to other places of China. Though China had claimed that the virus was passed on from bat in their wet market in Wuhan, there was plenty of evidence the virus could have escaped from the lab at Wuhan, either deliberately or accidentally leaked out. The virus quickly spread all over the world and caused losses of millions of humans and trillions of dollars. The total lack of cooperation, from China, in the investigations of its origins within China, and the enormous destruction that the virus had caused to every country in the world, made the world look at China, as a deceptive nation, which seemed to have an evil intent in causing harm, due its actions, or, lack of cooperation and transparency. Added to this, China's belligerent attitude, and warmongering, had a further hit on its reputation and image. These events had an enormous impact on the economic development of China. End of the Chinese miracle. Like they say, all good things come to an end, and the economic miracle of China seems to be coming to an end. In 2021, China was unable to sustain the speculative real estate market growth. The high debt levels of the real estate developers, and the banks, seem to have reached a tipping point, especially, when China had developed a habit of conflicts, all around the world. The changing demographics, also adds to the fragility of the Chinese economy. The lack of transparency in their economic data, is something the world has started worrying about. Even the Chinese Premier, Li Keqiang, has been highly skeptical, for a long time, about the official GDP numbers released, and has developed his own index to measure the economic growth of China, known as Kachang Index. Did CCP care more about the image of themselves than the economics? Many of the mega-projects initiated by the CCP in the modern era, like the Three Gorges Dam, South-North Water Diversion Project, HRW Project, Hong kong Zhuhai macau Bridge, High Speed Rail Project have all incurred huge initial costs and are expected to incur large operating costs as well. In the case of the High Speed Railway Network, even the best-case scenario involves heavy operating losses for a long period, due to connectivity to sparsely populated cities, in the west and central areas. 
However, the CCP leaders never wasted their time, in feasibility study, or, environmental impact, but moved forward with implementation of these mega-projects, and then did the feasibility studies later. The Chinese government's decisions are made by the top Chinese leaders, and the environmental consequences of water diversion projects, laws of physics, depletion of arable land, are always ignored. The personal aggrandizement of the Chinese leaders, in pushing the hugely expensive BRI, has added a new dimension to the debt levels of China, with no end in sight. The medium and long-term consequences, have been pushed way down in the priority list, in the quest to show high growth in GDP numbers, year after year. What is in store for China? Some believe, when the true picture emerges, the Chinese economic miracle may prove to be the biggest accounting scandal in history. Some believe that China has had its best years of economic growth until a certain point. When things couldn't be kept up, China started their shady practices, which proved to be highly unsustainable. And only a few still believe that the Chinese economy will bounce back and reach its growth trajectory back again. Only time will tell, who is right, and, who is wrong. Thanks for watching.